you can um if you could just uh, let us know by saying yes or no how many of you are working or have worked extensively with uh, kiddos or families who have had a kid with the reactive attachment disorder I see some hands, that's great. Okay, all right. Okay, well, let's start actually with some of our- uh, A lot of comments on chat, we also- Perfect, I don't see them. So hopefully there is a lot of, uh, hopefully there is a lot of comments and a lot of uh, our participants are going to give us some uh, absolutely wonderful ideas so we can all incorporate. We'll start with a little bit, I'm going to skip some of the introduction because you most, most of you are quite aware with reactive attachment. I mean, you are quite knowledgeable about this and you will get a copy of this PowerPoint. So I'd like us to kind of dance around those, but spend most of our time with what can we do? How can we help those particular children and, and those particular families? So really to have that attachment or why do we talk so much about that attachment? It's really a, a very strong bond that it's created between a person. Um, between two people and it has to have certain things for that particular bond to actually develop and to become a strong one. Not only we need to have the person usually is a parental figure, but also we need to have that significant relationship and we need to have that proximity. So it has to be a physical contact. Basically the attachment figure cannot be in, in a distance. It has to be close by to the child so the child can actually create this attachment with the, with the caregiver. And this particular attachment or this particular relationship, it provides that security, that comfort that the child needs, not just for the moment, but to be able to understand that the child is experiencing the environment as a safe environment, which can help later with uh, how the child perceives itself and how the child perceives their, their world. Um, this relationship is very important as it really allows the child to explore, to explore the interactions that he has or she has with others, to interact with the environment, to share the experiences. Uh, it really teaches the kids what do they think about themselves and how they perceive themselves and the world. And the more of that secure and strong that attachment relationship is, the more those kids not only bond with the caregiver, but the higher their self-esteem, the more they are willing to experience the world in a, in a different way. They, they are willing to take certain risks that the person that another child who does not have those particular experiences or does not um, perceive the relationship or the environment as a safe can take. So really that bond is so important when it comes to not only the day-by-day -day moment, but also in the long-term development of the child. Um, however, some of, our, some of the kids who are struggling with this particular disorder with reactive attachment, they perceive the world differently. And that's how we first know it can be a parent, an adoptive parent. It can be a grandma who is raising the child. It can be a teacher. They are first starting to notice some of those symptoms or some of those basically behaviors that those children are displaying. And they are saying, hold on a minute, something is not quite right. And uh, that's when they are seeking out for help, hopefully. But uh, these kids are perceiving their world as a dangerous place. They have not really attached well. They, don't, they have not had any consistency and predictability. They probably have gone to, through some traumatic experiences, which has really ha helped them believe that they are not safe, um, that they are basically constantly in danger. And they have, they have learned that people or things do not stay for a long time. Um, they have learned that one way for them to meet their needs is through displaying certain types of behaviors that we have uh, labeled at times as manipulative or aggressive or very charming, but has an agenda. So really these kids have been, these kids have been raised with, um, they've been raised with an idea that the world is not really a safe place for them. So this is kind of the very first thing that we notice with those particular kids. And our goal as therapists and parents and um, 
and the school, school counselor is to really help them understand what their needs are, understand what their behaviors are. Why are they doing what they are doing? Really, they are doing the best they can, but really they don't know how to meet their needs. So if we can help those kids understand what their needs are and understand how to meet those needs in a much more effective way, that can be one of our ways to help, to help those particular kids. Um, a lot of times we see physical uh, development issues. They are not quite, uh, they are not as big as their counterparts would be. They are mentally, emotionally a little bit behind. Um, but for the most part, they do really see themselves as they're not good enough. Um, because if they were good enough, their mom would not have left them or their grandma would not have uh, taken them to another place. So really they have experienced the world in a way that all the relationships, all the interactions that they have had with different individuals, especially adults, have given them the idea, I'm not good enough. So we've got to really help those kids understand that uh, that's not the best way to look at themselves. Well, they have had some difficult experiences, but there is also the, the other way of experiencing the world. The world is a safe place. Adults are safe. Adults can be trusted. Adults can be, uh, can be people who can meet, who can help those kids meet their needs. We see those kids with poor self-concept, self-esteem is low, uh, poor self-care. They do have a lot of time, low expectations about themselves, but they also are not very engaged in social interactions. They are going to, basically they don't, their confidence is not very, it's not very high. So they're going to be that kid who is just waiting for others to do things rather than them. So lack of empathy, um, a lot of times those kids have had or have experienced difficult, difficult, have been in difficult situations and they have been hurt by adults or by the situation. So for them, they have created this level of mistrust for different uh, environments or different adults who have been in the role of caregiver. And uh, because of their hurt, one thing that they have learned is that I don't have to have empathy for others. If I've been hurt, I can, I can hurt others too. So that's a lot of times we see this lack of empathy with those kids. And the, the good thing is that just like everybody else, it can be taught. It's a skill that they can teach. But a lot of times you're going to also see those kids so preoccupied with issues of fairness, especially issues of fairness. There is a need for being in control. Think about this, with those kids, adults, um, caregivers have done what they needed to do and there was no control on the kiddo's life, meaning the kids did not have control. They were done things too. They didn't choose those things. So their preoccupation with control, which can be really a preoccupation that can be shown in different ways like uh, safety or fairness. You see the fairness quite a bit, but it's really one of their ways to say, I have no control. I have not had control for a long time, and I'd like to have some control. You see those kids as highly overreactive. Um, they are very impulsive. They have a very difficult time with tolerating stress, with managing their, managing their emotions. A lot of times they do not even understand the emotions. So that can be also another way for us to help those, to help those kids with being able to recognize what emotions they are experiencing. How are they experiencing that emotion? Where are they experiencing that emotion? And what is triggering? And what does that emotion mean for them? So uh, there are so many ways for us to, to really help those uh, particular kids who are struggling with those symptoms. Um, one thing that has been very important for me is to help my own self as a therapist to understand what is the need that they have at this time? What is the function of this behavior? Because when I understand the need, where I, when I understand what are they trying to accomplish, uh -oh. that, then all of those behaviors that we see with those kids, like deceitful, controlling, demanding, manipulative, or charming to get what they want, then that makes sense. So in our, before I label a behavior, I really try to push myself into what is the function of this behavior? What is the need that this kid is trying to accomplish? And in their way, they are trying to meet their needs, 
in probably not the most socially appropriate way. So helping them understand that it's very important as well. Some common themes that you see at home or at the school or also in therapy, wherever uh, some of those kids are functioning, those different environments, you see quite a bit of anxiety and mistrust toward the adult figures. It can be an authority figure, it can be a caregiver figure, but you are going to see the anxiety. Um, again, the need for control, they view themselves as they view themselves as I'm not good enough because if I was good, then mom would have been with me. Mom would not have given me away. Um, they do have no regards for others. Um, and again, it goes back to the hurt that they have experienced. And they are sometimes aggressive and provocative. Um, I'll actually um, tell you about one of my kids um, that I used to work with. This particular boy um, just came to our facility and he was very small in stature. He was, um, he had gone from several foster, from one foster home to another, has been physically abused to different foster homes. And by the time that he came to us, he was in, um, he was placed with a good family, but they were not adopting him yet. It was just a foster family. Um, I had gotten all my kids and we were going to do a group and these kids were um, elementary age children. I had boys and girls. Um, he had just come, he was probably on his second day at our facility and out of the bloom, as soon as the group started, I was just trying to seat everybody, he picks the biggest, the biggest person in the group who also was known as the bully, um, of that particular facility and it just punches him on the face. And I'm just, how did this happen? Where did this came, come from? But the more I looked at the behavior, that aggression, um, the more I thought, what was the need that he had right now? And the need for that particular boy was to establish himself. He was the newest kid. He knew that he would be picked on. He was the smallest kid. He knew that he would be picked on. So his aggressive behavior was to meet that need. Don't mess up with me. You cannot hurt me. He had been hurt in every single environment that he had been before in those foster homes. So when he came with us, really, he was so hyper vigilant. So you can see some of those behaviors are not necessarily the very clean cut behaviors that we might label as, okay, aggressive or manipulative. Think about what is their need? Um, what are they trying to accomplish? They are quite, quite concerned about being abundant again. Even when they go to a wonderful family, a foster home or they get adopted, even though things are looking fine and everything is going well and the family might be so loving and caring, but in the back of their head is again, is this my last home? What, hap what, what if I will be taken away again? So that fear of abandonment is a real fear for them. And it really pushes certain behaviors. And because of that fear of abandonment, that fear might also, um, might also start um, elicit some of those aggressive behaviors. If you are going to hurt me again, if you're going to take me to another home, I might just hurt you. So hurt you before you hurt me. That's a very common theme that you are going to notice with, uh, with kids who are struggling with reactive attachment disorder. So if we have that in mind, that fear of abandonment is so real and it's so, it's so big for those kids, that can be something for us to really provide that safety and consistency and that uh, I am a safe person for you. Um, a lot of times those kids are going to avoid intimacy. It doesn't make sense for them to get close to, to a person. Um, it doesn't make sense for them to get close because when I got close to mom, mom sent, me to an, mom sent me to a foster home. When I got close to my foster mom, she sent me to another facility. So not having that stability in the environment, it really pushes those kids toward avoid intimacy. It's not really worth it for them. Um, as a matter of fact, not only it's not worth it because of that lack of consistency and stability, but they also have been hurt from those particular situations and relationships that they try to get close. So it's for them is 
again, I'm displaying, I, I put this wall around me and I can be aggressive, I can be manipulative, I can be whatever we are going to notice in those behaviors. But the real need there is so I can protect uh, myself. So you are not going to abandon me again. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be hurt again. So again, it really comes to that need that they have for that stability and their safety because they haven't really gotten it yet. Um, they haven't gotten it growing up. So um, they are going to actually push sometimes. They are going to have this yo-yo relationship. Um, a lot of times that pushing, that yo-yoing and punishing the adult, even the adult is doing the best they can to become a safe figure, a safe relationship person, that pushing has also a meaning. Before you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you, or I'm going to see, are you going to be just like that other person, that other foster mom who left, who left me? So I'm going to push you just to see, what are you going to do when I become bad? When I act out, are you going to be there for me? Or are you going to leave me just like the other people have done? And if you leave me, there is no point for me to become close to you. So that aggression that we see sometimes, that yo-yoing or that punishing, it's really for them to understand how safe, how stable, how constant you are as a caregiver. Um, again, understanding their needs. Um, a lot of times those kids, because things have been happening to them, happening to them, happening to them, and they had no control, they haven't really learned how to express their needs in a, and, and their feelings in a safe way. And if they try to, they probably were punished. Um, unfortunately, I have worked with certain, with certain kids that did not even dare to say that they have been physically abused or sexually abused by another, by another kiddo who was in the same foster care because they were afraid that they were going to be taken away. They were going to be punished. So that, that fear that they have is very, uh, very real. With a couple of kids that I remember uh, working pretty close, um, by the time that they came to, to see me as a therapist, I was in a residential facility, but um, they had been severely, severely physically abused by some other kiddos in the same foster home. They were willing to stay in that environment and take the abuse just because they saw the environment as a stable place. They were willing to take the abuse, which was a better option for them than say something and risk them being moved again and again and again. So that hurt by previous relationships, it really teaches them how to not express their, their feelings in a positive way or not express them at all. They learn, most of the time, they learn how to express their needs and their feelings through anger. And all we see is the anger. All we see, basically, that anger is the tip of the iceberg. But what's under? Under it is there, there is a lot of hurt. There is a lot of fear. There is a lot of anxiety. So one thing that I'd like to say to you all today um, don't just look at the symptoms. We've got to look at what are their needs and how those needs are going to, and how they are trying to meet their needs. Um, all right. Any questions so far, you guys, or any other things that I've not mentioned that you have seen on your in your practices? Okay, we'll continue, but please do interrupt me if you want to share something. Okay, so you get one of those kiddos, you are a therapist or you are a parent who is willing to do foster care or you are adopting or you are working in a school setting or you might be one of the school counselors. And these kiddos are coming with certain behaviors. You've got to really learn how to understand what's going on with those kids. So here I've got some things that are Good for us to know in any professional, in any helping profession that you might be in, or even if you are a parent, what are some things to know if you are going to even adopt a child, even going to work with those, um, with those kids? I'd like to start with the historical fa factors. What was their care when they, when they grew up? 
did they receive enough, did they receive good care from their caregivers? Were they neglected? Had they ha have they had any trauma? Um, any loss of parents, because that's a trauma on its own. How did they get from their caregivers to somebody else? What were the situational issues or what were the relational issues that made it really difficult for that child to be raised by their own parents? Um, any particular illnesses? Uh, sometimes we don't really think about illnesses, but illnesses also create a disruption of that attachment bond between the child and the caregiver. Sometimes when the child will require hospitalization for a long time, it's very difficult for the caregiver to actually spend a lot of time with the, with the child. Actually, I was one of those kids. Um, fortunately, um, my mother did a great job with being there with me at the hospital, but I, uh, as I'm told, I don't remember much, but I was a sickly child and my mother knew about attachment. So for her to create that bond with me, it was her coming to the hospital almost every day. Between my dad and my mom, somebody was there. Uh, so they were able to maintain that attachment. But there are a lot of times that illnesses made it difficult. And because the caregivers are also getting tired from, for how, from how much they need to comfort this child, for how, from how much, how much care and time they need to spend with this child. So illness kind of... Uh, prevents that uh, bond between the caregiver and the child. And it also can be on the, other, on the other end as well, if the caregiver is struggling with an illness that does not allow that caregiver to spend so much time uh, to create that attachment bond with the child. So it can go in, it can go in both directions. Um, I'd like to know what are the, basically if abuse has happened, what is the timeline? I'd like to know what are the current symptoms that the child is demonstrating. I really like to see, um, I am pretty big on play therapy and I really like to see the component of child's play because I believe that unconsciously those kids are going to demonstrate whatever has been going on in the past, whatever is in their unconscious in their, in their elements of play. So I'd like to see what are those elements of play? Are they enacting the trauma? Are they identifying with the victim or the perpetrator? Because that will tell you quite a bit about what might have happened in their past. Um, are they eating and sleeping well? If they are not sleeping well, that's an issue there. There might be some anxiety as well. Um, any sexual boundaries, any sexual preoccupation, um, any somatic symptoms. Um, I had a kiddo some times ago when I, uh, when I worked with her. <laughs> Her mother had died at, uh, when, the, when the girl was pretty young and she started to develop these symptoms of being always sick. Really what was going on is she was afraid that something is going to happen to her dad, that she became symptomatic now, physically somatic, that uh, she was not going to school. Really there was other things that were going on, was going on. Her anxiety increased so much. So even though somatic symptoms, if we understand, what is the pattern? Why are they doing this? Do we have those somatic symptoms at the same time? What is going on next? What are they trying to avoid? So this way we can help really understand what are they really struggling with? What are their needs? Rather than just focus on the, on the symptoms that we see on the top of the iceberg. Um, I'd like to see if the child is safe. Not only the child is safe, that would be one of the first steps, but also people around him, around him or her. Any sexual boundaries, any physical boundaries, violations, I'd like to know about those, but any suicide or any self-harm issues. Um, I'd like to know if there are also other diagnoses, because if there is um, PTSD, anxiety, or any depressive mood disorder, Maybe some of that anxiety, maybe some of those behaviors can be addressed by those symptoms rather than simply everything can be going to reactive attachment disorder. So this is something for us to remember. Um, I'd like to see the patterns on their behaviors. How many times do we have those meltdowns? How long do they last? When is the time that they are going to uh, give those meltdowns? If they are, let's say, every time mother goes to work, we have a meltdown. There might be a good possibility that uh, the child is thinking that the caregiver might not come back. So that fear, again, the fear of abandonment is so big and it's so real with them. They usually have a very difficult time with 
self-soothing when they are upset. So I'd like to know how that goes for these kids and what can I provide? Can they actually self-soothe or not? What kind of coping skills, what kind of items do they need to know? A big indicator of uh, frustration tolerance is those transition periods. Um, what do we do when we say, okay, we have to end play and we're getting, going to get ready for dinner. We're going to stop watching TV or being in your tablet and we're going to brush teeth. So what happens during those transition times? Um, how, how independent they are. Um, I had uh, this particular girl that I told you who mother had died. The level of independence was very, very low. Um, at that time, she was seeking actually for a caregiver who could be like her mother. Um, she would call the mother and we would, talk, we would talk to her about, we can help you like your mother. Actually, she would address me a couple of times as, can you be my mother? And I said, and I've said to her, no, I cannot be your mother, but I can help you like your mother would. So really understanding where she is and what needs she has. Um, it became with her because of the need for that connection with the caregiver, especially a female caregiver became so big for her that even her hygiene started to strut, to suffer. She could not brush her teeth. And uh, at one point I thought, maybe if I use reverse psychology or something like this, it might help. And I said to her, you know, if you don't keep brushing your teeth, then I'll have to come and brush, brush your teeth. And she luck, liked it. She kind of uh, gave me the toothbrush and said, go ahead and brush, brush my teeth. And I said, okay, I created something for myself now, but deep down I understood what she was trying to do. It was that connection because mother died when this girl was so young, she had not had enough time to have had mother take care of her. So she was really looking for me who was her therapist to really be helping her with those physical tasks just like her mother would have helped her. So to really be able to also say to her, you can do this on your own, that's our task. We, we don't necessarily want those kids to be where they are. We need to increase their level of independence and level of functioning to where they need to be. So, all right. I'd like to also do some family assessments. I'd like to see what kind of conflict there is in the home what kind of conflict there was and what kind of conflict there is. And the reason why I want to know the past and the present is, is because it will tell me what kind of environment he, the child grew up in and what kind of environment the child has currently. Because some of that withdrawing, if there is conflict in the home, some of that withdrawing might be because the child does not want to deal with more conflict. So um, it's not about the child. Sometimes it's about basically this is more of a systemic view of the child's level of functioning and behavior. So I'd like to really uh, assess in as many areas as possible, not just, the, not just the child, but also the school and the family. What is going on? What are the relationships in those environment? What kind of uh, stability the child has in this particular environment? Do we have rigid structure or not? While structure is good because those kids try, uh, thrive in structure, um, too much of it, if it is rigid, is just going to be into that uh, it's going to reinforce the view, I'm not good enough. That's why you need to actually put the limits and the rules on me. So we've got to really assess about what is the parenting style? Um, what are the interactions? Do we have more positive interactions at home or do we have more negative interactions? The more negative interactions, the more the idea, I'm not a good enough child for you. So we've got to really assess the family environment. Um, I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, that is not my, not is my attempt, but I have worked with one family only um, that said to the, the, the parents came to me and said, we'll be honest, honest with you. We are foster care parents because we need the money. And that's an unfortunate situation because if the foster parents are doing this simply for the money and there are so many Foster, foster home um, kids in that particular family, do the parents really have the emotional strength, the physical strength to really become that attachment, that safety attachment figure for this particular child? So I really would like to see what is the reasoning that parents have for the foster care or for the adoption or to really be the caregiver for this, for this particular child? 
If it is to help the child, great. But if it is simply to gain some, some uh, financial, to have some financial gain, then we really need to do some work with the parents to, yes, we understand your financial need, but also can you, can you help this child develop physically, emotionally, mentally, so the child can actually become more resilient and can experience self and the world in a much safer way. Um, there are a lot of times that language barriers and culture differences, especially if the child and the caregiver are from different cultures, it's uh, basically it impacts an emotional bond. If we cannot connect, if we don't understand what the other person needs, if we don't understand what the other person is saying, or if the cultural needs, or how can I say this? The needs for emotional contact are different from one culture to the other. It can be a little bit difficult. For, for example, I am from Albania. We are a very, very... Um, close culture my family if if you're a therapist and you're going to examine my family you're going to say you guys are enmeshed and i'll say no we're a close family it's just that that's how we function um, but my family or my emotional needs will be expressed differently than a family who comes from a different country um, family who actually if you can live in the same country and you can have different family needs and different ways to express those emotions. So even those cultural differences between us, uh, we can all be here in Utah and our cultural differences are different, so to speak. So just we need to recognize what are those cultural differences? What do the kids need? Okay, let's get into treatment. First thing, provide safety and security. We've got to create that emotional attachment figure that is available for the child. It cannot just be, well, I'm available right now, but I'm not going to be available later. We need to have that consistency and that consistency can be created the more we interact with, uh, with the child and with the caregiver. Um, I absolutely like the playful element of our interactions because that's what they understand. Play is their natural world. While us have to go to work, when kids engage in play, they are doing their work and that's where they are going to express their things. So as much as we, as playful as we can be with those kids, the best is uh, that playfulness is going to really create opportunities for their social learning. Um, Attachment oriented, we've got to create a safe space for those kids to express their fears and anxieties and their understanding of the situation without being afraid that they are going to be uh, judged. We have to give a lot of validation and we have to just accept their reality for what it is because that's what really it is. I also like the cognitive, the CBT approach because it really helps them with their beliefs of themselves everybody else, their caregivers and the world. So hopefully they can, they can switch the, their thinking from this is an unsafe place to this can be a safe place. This can be safe adults. I can go to them and ask for, for help from them. So the most effective we talked about when we did the, when we are going to assess, it's, it's great to use that uh, systems approach, but also for the treatment, the best way to do this is to use that systemic approach. So the best way to work with those kids is by involving the parents and the teachers. And school counselors, if you are here today, and I believe we have some, you've got a great opportunity to involve both the teachers and the parents at school. So I hope that you are, I hope that you are doing, um, that you are doing this, and I hope that you are working with, uh, with kids with reactive attachment at your school. Um, we've got to really, meet these kids where they are and just show as much understanding and empathy, especially when it comes to aggressive behavior. So don't focus on what did you do, but focus on what has happened to you? What were you experiencing that you were actually, that you engaged in this particular behavior? So again, understand the need. That need is going to help us understand what's on the surface of the, of the iceberg. Okay, best therapeutic style reciprocal, proactive, engaged, and, exper and experiential, empathy, acceptance, validation. While we are providing that comfort that creates an environment for the child to explore and resolve their past trauma. 
unless those elements are going to happen. And again, it's not going to be everything in every single interaction that you have. But if you can have most of those things in your interactions with the kids, especially that empathy and acceptance, engagement, validate them for what they are going through, even when they made the biggest mistake, um, be there, be there with them and experience that situation how they are experienced and teach them how to deal with that situation in a better way next time that they are going to deal with it. Ex help them understand how to deal with that particular stress in a more effective way and help them understand that just because they messed up, there is nothing to be ashamed about because with every time that they mess up, they're, they are reinforcing again their negative, negative thinking about their own selves. Um, this is kind of breaking down the relationship or the therapeutic approach. Um, they need all of those things. They need the physical aspect, the emotional aspect, the intellectual aspect, and our interpersonal relationships. They do need us to be as warm as empathetic. They do need us to have that nurturing touch. Um, they do need that physical connection. They do need us to also be adults and helpful and uh, um, what's the word I'm looking? I don't know, helpful caregivers that we are not going to simply be lenient because of what has happened to them in the past. They do need the structure that we can provide. They do thrive from the structure. So setting the limits, setting the boundaries is a good thing. But as you set those boundaries, really go or do that with empathy and understanding. So we've got to encourage and validate them and empower them rather than simply focus on, let's set the rules, let's discipline it. Just simply doing the disciplining can be perceived as, um, I'm, not a bad, I'm not a good kid, that why, that's why you are disciplining me. All right, stages, safety and stabilization first. I want to know, um, I want basically, if I'm that kiddo, I need to know that my environment is safe and predictable so I can actually feel okay in there. A lot of this time can be one-on-one -on -one with the caregiver. Um, then I start with symptom reduction because there is anger management, there is manipulation, there is probably aggression. Um, so there are, there are behaviors that needs to be controlled and those kids need to understand how to meet their needs in a more appropriate way. So reducing self-destructive behaviors, finding different alternatives to, to those most likely angry behaviors, understanding how they can tolerate stress, providing them the skills that they need to, to have to actually meet those behaviors, meet their needs with different behaviors. Uh, with symptom reduction, again, coping skills, as much coping skills as you can have. And uh, that's when it comes the nurture and the validation. Let's see how you handle the situation. What can you do next time? What will happen if you do this the same, whatever you did, what could be another way? So you're not shaming them for what they have done. They didn't really meet that. They didn't really meet their needs in an appropriate way, but what can you do next time? So you are increasing their resilience without, without uh, making them feel, feel ashamed about what they have, what they have done. Um, all right. Um, a lot of those kids have gone through some traumatic experiences. So being able to process the past trauma make, uh, makes a big difference for those particular kids. And the idea is to create healing images. Um, their idea of caregivers environment have been that they are not safe. So to create different healing images, to create a positive view of themselves, it's very important. And then, so the first stage was basically st creating stability, making sure that everybody is safe, including the child and others. The second stage for treatment will be basically symptom reduction. The third stage is the longest stage when you are doing um, a lot of skill development. This is where the resiliency can increase. And you're also going to find yourself doing also a lot of maintenance in here. So this is your last or the longest stage of your treatment where you are constantly teaching them how to view themselves differently, what coping skills they can actually have and practice to manage stress in a different way. Um, how can they say yes and no? How can they create good boundaries? How they can create empathy for others and for themselves as well. So a lot of problem solving here and a lot of 
and teaching of coping skills. How can we help these kids? Well, our main goal should be to keep the child safe. So therapists, teacher, caregivers, go slow. Go with the child's pace. They will teach you how fast is fast and how slow is good for them. But they do need the structure. They need us as caregivers to provide that reassurance that they are doing good, that they can be safe. This is a safe place. The school is a safe place. The teacher is a safe person. You can tell me anything. You can tell me anything you want and you won't get in trouble. So we do, they do need us to, um, they do need us to help them in a way that they can experience themselves as a person who has some worth and some value. They can experience the environment and the adult, their caregiver as a safe person or as a safe environment. What they need really is that is they need to belong. They need to belong and they need to be validated for their feelings. They need to have that validation from us that what they have experienced in the past, it has been very difficult. So if we can acknowledge that pain, if we can acknowledge that a lot of those behaviors that they have demonstrated have been just uh, misunderstood by adults because we have labeled them as he's an aggressive kid. She is so manipulative. But really, it has been a label that we simply saw the, uh, the top of the iceberg. Deep down, it was that hurt that nobody validated. It was that pain that it was not acknowledged. So what they are really looking for, or what they really need is to validate their, their own experiences. A lot of time we see those kids who are very resistant. And very often we adults meet the resistance with more resistance. It doesn't work most of the times because when we just do, when we meet the resistance with resistance, what we are doing is helping them create this or enhance their view of themselves. I'm not good enough. The environment is not safe. So how about we just roll with that resistance? Um, we roll with it and we help them understand that this particular behavior is not what gets them their needs met. There is a different, there is a different way for them to meet their needs. There are a lot of power struggles with those kids. So if the more we stay calm and proactive, we validate and empower their pain. So if Johnny pushed his sister, pushing his sister is not okay. But if we understand what was going on with Johnny, so if we can understand the hurt that he experienced, it makes Johnny feel, okay, now I, can, I, now I know that mom or dad gets me. So they're not just focusing on why I pushed my sister. They're also focusing on acknowledging whatever I'm experiencing, whatever emotion I'm experiencing. Um, a lot of those kids will thrive if we give choices. The reason why I'm saying that is that for a long time, they have struggled with lack of control. Things were done to them and they did not choose what was done to them. So if we give them choices, and again, these choices are within your limits, you decide if Johnny is going to do A or B, um, but these are your own choices, but Johnny doesn't know that. Johnny thinks, okay, now I have power to choose what I want. Oh. Now I can increase my sense of control. I decide what happens to me rather than others telling me, rather than others telling me what I need to do. So really uh, providing them with some self, with some sense of increased control, that's very important. Um, a lot of times I've had kiddos who say to me, a lot of, uh, you probably get those, I don't know, in the session. And usually that's an avoidant technique. I actually say to um, some of the kids that I work with, I, I work with a lot of teenagers these days, um, but I tell them, you can have three I don't knows in the session. And then after the third one, and yes, I do count. <laughs> they count sometimes too. But after the third one, I say, we'll take the time to see what you can come up with. What I'm really doing is I'm telling them, you are capable to think of yourself. You are capable to come up with different solutions. So that's one way for them to increase their uh, resiliency. Well, we work, we talked about systemic work, right? So we got to work with adults as well. They need to experience us, whoever us are, a mom, a dad, a neighbor, a teacher, a school counselor, a um, an uncle or an aunt. 
They need to experience us as understanding, interested in them and their experiences. Responses, responsive and fun. Now, you don't have to be who you are not, but you can find fun in their activities. So, um, but also set, the, set the, re, the limits and the rules because they do well with structure. And if you can, really choose your battles because you're not going to win all of them. So avoid power struggles and decide what's the most important thing for you. Um, a lot of times, Parents are exhausted by parenting a child with special needs and reactive attachment kids are children with special needs. It's just, we need to validate the parents for their efforts. A lot of times parents are thinking that, well, I'm not a good parent, that's why my child is reacting this way. Not necessarily. Well, we can look at the parenting practices, but parents need to understand that, you know what? <laughs> they are probably doing the best they can as well. So. The child's behavior is not simply a reflection of the parenting practices, but might be pretty much from past trauma or something else. So we have to help understand, we have to help parents understand that they are doing the best they can. Um, and if they are not, other things, I mean, other things happen, but uh, really we've got to, we've got to really give a, a boost to the parents because they are feeling quite worn down from some of the high intense needs that, uh, of those kiddos with special needs. Um, they've got to have a united and supportive parental team and really need to connect with, really need to connect with other parents in the community, with the school. So the school understand also that there are struggles in the family and the parents are doing the best they can, but that's how school counselors and therapists and parents uh, and teachers can work in the United, in a united front. So it's not just Johnny's behaviors at home is not just at home, but if school um, therapist, parent can come up with the same plan and can reinforce that plan in different situations, in different settings, then we provide more of that consistency for the child. So, um, but parents need to also understand that they are not struggling on their own, that there are other people there, other parents there who really are struggling as much as they are. And if the parents can understand one thing that they need to increase their positive interactions with their child, the more positivity they have, the better it's going to be. And it's not going to change overnight. I understand that, but find really opportunities to laugh with your child, find opportunities to be a child with them and to engage in some of those, some of those um, activities that make a child happy, it's going to create, it's going to add to their bond, to their stability. Um, so it's a really good way to spend some time with the kids. Elsa? Yes. Are there any book recommendations for parents? Oh, you know what? Uh, let me check on it. I don't have the, yes, there are but I probably need to give you a list so you can pass them on. I can't really think of, um, I can't think of anything right now. Uh, let me see. The Primal Wound. The Primal Wound is a really good, easy book to read. It's an old book though. I've really enjoyed that. Um, but it really talks about how to parent those kids who have had the trauma since basically um, they were younger. So Michael, let me let me put the list together for you and uh, you can pass it on with the PowerPoint. I'll attach it to the PowerPoint and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a RAD um, therapy directory that exists? I don't know of that. I, I wonder if one of our participants can help us with that. Um, someone's saying the power of showing up is great. I've never heard that one. Let me, we're kind of getting close here. Let me, for those of you that are having to get on offline or off for one o'clock appointments, I just put into the chat the code word RAD32222. And there's also the link for the evaluation. If that evaluation link isn't working, a lot of times it may be uh, your company has an internet firewall that it can't get through. Um, I know that um, it happens for many businesses. For us here at the hospital, I can't access this um, Google form. Um, I know the IHC often has that opportunity, that, um, that barrier um, firewall there. So you may have to do it at home or on, an, on a phone or, um, 
or a, another computer. Um, if you can't copy and paste this from this showing right here, if you'll email me from the invite, I'll send you this link and then you can access it. So, um, but yeah, and I would love everybody to fill, if you want a copy of the, the slideshow and the link, please go fill out this form, even though you're not um, looking for the CE credits, because we are interested in knowing what topics you would like classes on. Um, so I do ask that question in this, even though you're not needing that CE credit, if you'll help us out on letting us know on topics and stuff, um, we'd love to hear from you on that. So um, I know, like I said, I know some are going to have to get off, but Viosa, if you want to kind of, you can wrap it up. And if anybody's got questions. Sure. Um, I really don't have much else to say, but really creating that stability for the kids. I think it's, oh, I was in the very last page. So we're right on time really creating that stability, that emotional connection, and try to understand what the needs of those kids are rather than focus on the symptoms. So um, really guys, thank you for attending this presentation. I appreciate you being here and I appreciate your time. Any questions you guys have or any comment, anything that has helped you in your practice? While you're asking the questions, I'm gonna steal the screen and I'll show you um, what we've got as far as uh, I hope you can see that. There's the code. Um, again, I'll paste the link and stuff. But our next one in two weeks, um, April 12th, I believe it is, we have Dr. Christy Kane is coming on and she is going to talk trauma and, and, and talk some of that trauma information. So we're we're really excited about getting that. We're, thank you, Viola, for sharing. Is there any questions or comments that anybody has? Lisa, I'm not sure. Oh, I've never heard anybody saying that they can't copy it out of there. Try that one again. Maybe it was connecting to the other one. Um, if it's not working, like I said, kick, uh, kick me over an email and I will, um, I'll send it to you. Um, Lisa, I'll, I'll make a note here to get that link over to you. Questions? Hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you for attending. If there's anything we can do to help people out, please reach out to us. We want to be a resource for the community. Mike, that access is, Mike, again, I said a lot of times it might be firewalls are keeping you out from the link. Um, if you want to try it on another, another device, um, that may be the, the, what's stopping you from doing it. I am hearing yeah, I was, from some that the was, link did work. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, sorry. I, I just wasn't able to even copy the link to paste it into another browser. So I, I don't know. I'll keep working on it. Do you have my email? I do not. Let me, you're seeing the screen, right? Yeah. Oh, If you'll email me, I will send you that link. Thank you. Do you see that, my email there? Yeah. OK, yeah, just email me, and I'll send you the link. Thank you. And those, if for those who are still on, if you have a question for Vielsa, reach out to us. Um, if there's something she didn't answer, or if you think of something that comes up, we'd be happy to answer that through emails and discussions and stuff. It's a quiet crowd today. It is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting lots of thank yous on the chat and stuff. Yeah, thank you.
Michael, I'm really excited about the next one. Looks very, very good. We are, we just barely, um, Brianne just barely got her um, committed on the date and everything just yesterday. That's great. Um, That's wonderful. So it's going to be, we're, we're quite excited about um, the topic and what she, she's going to be sharing. Is Lisa, are you still on Lisa? Oh, she got off. No other questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, Sterling, what I'll do is I will send um, in a couple of days, let everybody kind of fill out the evaluation. I will send um, the link or I'm, I'll send the certificate. I'll send uh, a PD, PDF of the slides and I'll send a link for the recording of the class. And I'll email those to you in a couple of days after we've given everybody a chance to, to fill out those evaluations. I think right now probably 